Rock Seller Magazine. Hi, I'm Lisa Loeb, and I have a brand new album out. I just want to let you know I have a new record out called Run To Me. Hi, Hi. we're Pablo Cruz. I got a new single. I've got new music. I got a new hip. No, 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 no. Not, not that kind of hip. Contests, giveaways, prizes. Daily free newsletter. Never miss out. Rock Music News delivered. RockSellerMagazine.com slash subscribe. Thank you all for joining us. And it's actually National Poetry Month, and we're excited for today's guest. We have Stephen Kalinchi, spoken word artist and lyricist, and we have Mason Granger, Salome Agbaroji, and Courtney. I'm excited to talk to them. But really quick, I have some great news, and I know you're excited because I'm about to tell you that the concerts on the park are back. June 27th, I'm excited, I know you are too. And also the Side of Music Photo Contest starts today, okay? So make sure you head on over to uh, valleycultural.org for all that information. And I'm excited because I actually wrote a poem and it's very meaningful, but we're gonna get to it before that really quick update. I got my stimulus check. I'm excited and I've already spent it, obviously. Um, you know, it went to the kid, obviously. It went on Flavin' Hot Cheetos, gaming stuff, sweatshirts, um, you know, potato chips, more potato chips, candy, you know, all that stuff. He actually let me have uh, iced coffee for the week. And with the words of, Mom, I am the reason why you got the stimulus check. And I'm like, you know what? You just got the gift. Okay. <laughs> Well, I'm happy I got it, okay? Okay, so are you guys ready for the poem? I'm excited. I need to take a breather. Here we go. I'm excited. I'm nervous because, you know, it's in that poetry month and got to make sure it sounds right. I don't want to miss any words. Okay, ready? Roses are red. Violets are blue. Watch our podcast. Art's on the move. Oh. <laughs> That was so intense, you guys. I was so nervous. I'm excited to uh, present our very first guest. Are you guys ready? I'm so ready. We have poet, spoken word artist, and lyricist, Stephen Kalinchi. Hello. Welcome to the show. Look at you. Hello. <laughs> Hello. It's it's Stephen Kalinich, but it's a tough one, so I'm not worried about it. Oh. Okay, thank you for correcting me. And how would you want me to call you, Stevie or Steven? You can call me Stevie if you want. It doesn't matter to me. Okay, I like Stevie. So we're going to go ahead and call you Stevie. Thank you for okay. joining us. Thank you. How are you? You're very, I'm great. You're very welcome. It sounds like an exciting show. Thank you so much. I'm excited to talk to you because it's, it is National Poetry Month. And you have a very interesting career. And go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm a poet and a lyricist and an artist. Um, since we don't have a lot of time, I started writing when I was about five years old. And when I became late teens, early 20s, I came to California. I met Jay Ward and Jim Critchfield that did that cartoon Bullwinkle, if you remember it. I don't know if you do remember no, it. No, I actually and, do remember, yes. And they sent me to Brother Records, Brian Wilson's company, and I got a contract within six weeks for with the Beach Boys. And then my career started from there and moved up till I'm doing many things now. It's over a 50 year career. So you could ask me anything. Oh my goodness. Um, I did hear that you did collaborate with many artists. Um, I, I'm, yes, I, I'm impressed with some of the names already. Can you please let tell us a little bit about that? Yes, I collaborated with Brian Wilson, uh, Paul McCartney, Brian May from Queen. I have a new album out now called The Essential Yo Mama with a few guest artists, and that's coming out. And then I have this video that's going to come out soon that you're going to show. I mean, we're excited to be showing that off later today. Also, um, when did you know that writing was something that you wanted to do? I think that 
I, I started writing at about five and I wrote a poem that wasn't the greatest poem. And from there, I just kept doing it. I think about 13, I started writing articles for World Peace and I ended up uh, in the 60s writing an album called A World of Peace Must Come with Brian Wilson. And it came out in 2014, so it's still very current. And it, it was released by Light in the Attic Records. So it's still going strong. And that was a good contact and opened up a lot of doors for me. That's awesome. What is actually one of the most significant projects that you have? Besides World of Peace, I would say that my duet for Paul McCartney and Brian Wilson, A Friend Like You, on the uh, Getting In Over My Head album, and Dennis Wilson, Little Bird in the 60s, which is just released on, it was on a TV show last year on HBO called Divorce with Sarah Jessica Parker. I'm very current now. I work with a group too that's very exciting uh, called The Tribe. And I've worked with Lawrence Juber, Ultra DJ, and I'm grateful to them. And we're still doing concerts all the time. I also work with the Homeless Foundations, which I have been for many years and I continue it with them. So I have a lot of causes and I've had a very productive career and I'm still doing things all the time. That's awesome. What was it like working with, uh, with Paul McCartney, the various artists that you, the names that you dropped earlier? Well, um, all my experiences have been wonderful, but I think the, one of the most intense was with Dennis Wilson of the Beach Boys. Uh, I don't know if you know the song Little Bird or Be Still or some of the ones, A Time to Live in Dreams, Rainbows, yeah. uh, a lot of them on the Beach Boys catalog. And the thing about him was I could recite a poem off the top of my head just spontaneously, and he could come back with a section with the melody already written. So all my songs with him were written where I did the words first, and he, out of the inspiration, he came up with the melody. And it was very exciting. That's awesome. So, uh, Stevie, when it's not COVID, uh, do you perform locally around town? What is it that you do? Yes, I perform around town. I make records. As I said, I perform with the tribe and I also have performed with Wild Honey. Uh, I did two songs on Al Jardine's album, which is just getting re-released. Al Jardine of the Beach Boys that sang Help Me Rhonda and many other songs. And that's coming out again in a couple of weeks. It's called Postcard from California. And they got a lot of David Crosby's on it, Glenn Campbell, a lot of other people. And that's coming out again. A re release. Awesome. And, and I have a song with Mary Wilson of the Supremes that's coming out very soon. It's called You Dance My Heart Around the Stars. She worked with us a lot at the tribe with Lori and myself. And it's a wonderful song. And Gus Tud Dudgeon, who's Elton John's producer, no longer with us, he produced that record. I, I'm very excited about it. She was a wonderful human being and a great artist. I've worked with Frank Black of the Pixies. Uh, we did a duet. Uh, Keith Reed that wrote Whiter Shade of Pale for Procol Harum. And I keep finding new collaborators. Sometimes I work with young, young people. I've worked with John Tiven, many, many people. Stevie, what was uh, actually one of your favorite pieces to perform? I mean, you have a lot, you know, but which one really actually, I really like this. This one is like dear to me, you know? I think my Galactic Symphonies are one of my favorite pieces. If you want, I could do a little short excerpt from it. I know we're limited, but... Yes, we would actually like it if we could keep it short. Okay. Never before in galactic span has been told the tale of man. Defies all bound, defies all space, upsets all theories, and in their place puts wisdom of the ancient race. Stories of creation throne of man who left his home from stars among the universe and found the earth alone, void of purpose without form, cold, barren, uniform, no room to differentiate choice from predetermined fate and save the world before it is too late. For mankind since time has opened up its book for a solution to savagery looks and all our undaunted saviors lead us to that same grave. So where can we find salvation? Can we discern from the movement of the tree within the quake, the presence or the power? 
through which earthly things take shape? Can we know from the pull of the planet and the stars, the life we within the atom, the life we know as ours, did man in his greatest age through every prophet and every sage ever calm the unstoppable rage, the ruthless destruction, the war, the hate, the cheating, and the lies? Did anyone stop the horror through the earthly wise? Did anyone you know of teach the roses how to grow? Show the harmony to maple leaves. Teach the river's rhythmic flow. On the other side of death is life and life is loving. And zombies who gather together in congregations and mass strangulations feel the bubble is bursting because their soul is thirsting, thirsting for a touch of the hand, the magic hand that with fingers finer than pure gold, fingers not made of flesh or bone, fingers that are all things. This magic hand echoes as a symbol in every land that is a part of every woman, every child, and every man. That's a, a combined ex excerpt from the Galactic. Wow, I am left speechless. Thank you for sharing that with us. That was really, really good. Also actually have a, um, a release video called Champions. Uh, we're actually gonna show it. Can you uh, tell us just a little bit about it? Well, I did it with Ralph Stevens and it's for women's Nash, uh, Women's Month, Women's Day, and we, we hope we've used it at different marches and stuff. We're hoping that it will encourage people to get more active with women's rights. We're for all kind of rights, but the women's rights is this one's focusing on. Um, and we decided to make this video. Okay, let's go ahead and show it. Everybody needs a champion Everybody needs a friend To stand by to protect you Upon who you depend Like the sun My champion in you. Someone to embrace you, wipe away the tears, calm your restless spirit, talk you through. Discouraged, don't give in. Everybody needs a champion to help you to be strong, to inspire and encourage.
Stevie, are you there? I, I'm going to cry right now because of you. <laughs> Stevie, I couldn't help but feeling very warm inside listening to the song, the music, the lyrics. Um, what did you feel when you like first saw the video and everything just coming together? And, uh, and also the, the, the singer that's singing it. It, it, it's there's been many versions but she has captured it it's just a wonderful emotional feeling because when I first wrote champion it's like people overcoming obstacles challenges in life and this and how we face this COVID and all the things and for women's right it, it applies to so many levels now and that's why I'm so inspired by young people and all people get but young people in the arts that carry it forward and I'd like to help in some way and inspire and encourage people. It made me feel good, but we got to do action. We can't just talk. To write great poems and great songs is wonderful, but we got to learn to apply these thoughts and our actions toward our fellow human beings. I think you definitely did that. Um, if anyone walks away with, you know, the, the way how your piece was put together, it was so heartwarming. And thank you for just providing that for us, for the world. You know, that was so beautiful. Well, You're so talented. I'm amazed by all of this. My goodness. Thank you so much. I'm grateful to be a part of this. We want to actually actually keep talking about any of the latest projects that you are doing now. We do, did mention of what you've done. Is there anything that you're doing in, in the future that's up and coming that you could share? Yes, I'm, I'm going to be working on another spoken word album. My album with a new Dennis Wilson song, which he's, he passed away in 1983, but I got permission from the estate and I redid it with John Tibbon. It's called Mabel. And I, it's not out yet, but it will be out. And it, I'm very excited because it's the first song that where he gave me the words I mean the melody and I put words to it and I never finished it and I asked if I could go to someone and the estate gave me permission so that's a really exciting new project and as I said the Mary Wilson project is coming out and I'm lined up for a few other things for movies and shows and I'm in a movie with Chris Alport uh, that he's directing called uh, Emily or Oscar it's about a girl that can't decide if she's going to be if he's going to take the girl or is he going to go for the Oscar and like the devil, it's a, it's like a Faust kind of thing. The devil's tempting him. It will give you all this, but you have to give up the girl or what's, what's the outcome. It, it's, it's a play on things that have been done, but it's, it's fant It's a fantastic fun little movie. And I play the part of the prophet, okay. which, but I'm not like a prophet. I'm more like, give me money, you know, like a prophet like that. I'm out for a prophet, but I pretend I'm the prophet. Okay. It's a fun Fun show, fun movie. I'm sure you're gonna do an amazing job with that. I can't wait to see see that when it comes through. So uh, we're gonna come back with you, Stephen, after a word uh, from our sponsors. Thank you so much. Good morning. At Amazon, we have husbands and wives that work together, daughters and mothers that work together, and we feel like a family together. You drive home, right? Don't always. <laughs> my name is Deontay, and I work with my fiance, Tiara. It's just fun to work with my best friend. <laughs> my daughter. <laughs> we rely on everybody else. It's like a big, huge family. I'm very thankful to have that. Love ya. Love you. The type of relationships that you create make you come in with a smile on your face. Hello, and welcome to the Valley Cultural Foundation's Arts on the Move event. I'm Congressman Brad Sherman from America's best name city, Sherman Oaks. If you or someone you know is having trouble dealing with any federal agency, perhaps a stimulus payment or difficulty with a PPP loan for small business, call my constituent services office at 818-501-9200. My staff works very hard. They'll solve your problem. And then I, Brad Sherman, take the credit. I think that's a great system. Again, our number is 818-501-9200. I'm Congressman Brad Sherman. Welcome back, everyone. I am your host, Calypso. I hope you're having a great time so far. We actually were uh, speaking with Stephen. Uh, I did, I'm gonna not say his name wrong. It was Stephen Kalinch. I think I said it right or wrong, I'm so sorry. But we were speaking to a poet and a very interesting man with so many uh, amazing ventures that he's had. And he's actually gonna come back with us later on in a little bit. But we actually, 
have uh, next on the show, we have Mason Granger from the Get Lit Words Ignite. He's actually a poet himself and the manager of the po of a public outreach. If you are there, Mason Granger, hello, welcome. Hi, how are you? Hello, doing well, good to be here. How are you doing? Good, thank you for joining us. It's uh, National Poetry Month, and who better person, you know, than to tell us about, you know, the Get Lit Foundation. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself and what is the Get Lit Foundation? For sure. Well, uh, so Get Lit is a uh, LA-based uh, nonprofit that basically to increase literacy in middle schools and high schools in Southern California through spoken word poetry and a particular uh, a particular formula, if you will, of uh, linking classic poetry with contemporary poetry and putting that in the hands of uh, of young people all around California and just showing them the connections and showing them that poetry doesn't have to be whatever the idea of poetry that they may have had coming in, that it can be something that's not only relevant to them as young people, but relevant through your entire life. And you can learn like, you know, life skills that you're going to carry on with you all through poetry. Got it. And actually, how was the program created? Um, so it was founded in maybe 2006 by Diane Luby Lane, who is our current uh, executive director. And she basically is a, for lack of a better word, a book nerd. I'm sure she would agree if she heard me say that. She is a book nerd and wanted to spread her love of books and classic poetry in particular uh, to, to kids. And so they put together a curriculum um, that's based on teaching these classic works of poetry, Walt Whitman's and, uh, you know, things from that generation all the way up to, uh, you know, two Kendrick Lamar albums ago was also also a classic poem that we teach in the classroom and just putting that in the hands of, of kids and um, getting them, you know, engaged in public speaking, reading, writing, memorization, all those things that are parts of, of any decent, you know, school curriculum, uh, but just all of it through the lens of, of spoken word poetry. Mason, how did you get involved with it? Um, so I uh, am kind of new to the West Coast. I was born in Philly, grew up in New Jersey, was in New York City for 10 years. And uh, over there, I was doing kind of analogous work. What Get Lit was happening here in 2006, me and two other guys uh, who I met in college were busy being the mayhem poets and based kind of on, a, on a, similar, a similar mission or a similar light bulb went off in our heads um, of being like, hey, I know I had this sort of uh, shying away from poetry because of whatever stereotype I, I had until I actually saw what spoken word poetry could be. And I was like, yeah, this is, this is amazing. And then there were English teachers in the middle 2000s uh, who were having the same issue teaching. They get to the poetry section, got to teach their kids and got nothing but moans and groans. But then they hired uh, the Mayhem Poets to come in and we did, an ass did assemblies and creative writing workshops. And then, you know, we walk out of there and kids are like, yo, poetry doesn't have to be that, but it could be this, it could be this, it could be this, it could be whatever I want. Great. And, uh, you know, just turning on minds. And so then uh, was doing that out there. And then my wife's career brought both of us out to LA. I reached out to get fit, said, hey, in a nutshell, want to hire me? And they said, hey, sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, there are a few back and forths in between, but uh, that's basically how it went. <laughs> Mason, throughout the year, you know, the program obviously has gone virtual, you know, through the, through the crisis. Do you feel that the students that are, that were in, actually enrolled did not get the full advantage? I believe that, I mean, in a short, yes, yeah. but also they're not done. You're never done. Once you have, are turned on to poetry, you're, you're here. You're, you'll be writing poems while you are literally a part of Get Lit. You'll be writing poems the year after you graduate, five years after you graduate. Um, and, and, I, and I come back to uh, this Arthur Ashe quote that is something along the lines of start, start where you are, use what you have and do what you can. And I think that, that that's what we as Get Lit have done. That's what everyone out in the world has done. Um, everyone's, everyone's doing their best. And um, yeah, we, we, we have we have managed to uh, to push emotions and impact through these glass screens. Yeah. Um, is it live? No, but 
will we be sitting here arts on the move next year doing this live yes and so we'll, we'll be there for it mason as a creator of the written word um, what was your passion to become an artist yourself i think that it comes from the same place that's in everybody it's just a matter of what you choose to do with those moments of inspiration when they come to you um, where everybody has those aha moments uh, but some people will have that idea and then they'll tweet it out real quick and then move on with their lunch uh, whereas myself and, and other poets have have come to do is have those aha moments and then write it down and then I, for me I get excited about oh I'm gonna come back to that later and I'm gonna turn that into like some fire you know <laughs> whatever it is um but but the moment though the moment of that inspiration is the same uh you know and, or, and painters will have that moment and then they they go paint about it a journalist will have that moment and then they go find that scoop um poets write poems uh, but but it's all from the same spark so speaking of writing poems what is the process when you create the music the poetry the script the lyrics? <laughs> It usually comes from one of those one of those spark moments, be it like a really good, a good poignant line or a nice turn of phrase or just being able to finally have clarity on an idea that was always coming out not quite right until one day you find those perfect words for it. Boom. And so then you have for me, I have that that thing that's like the mantelpiece of the poem, but I still may not know if is that the start of the poem and i start there and then write more or do i figure out some other place to start to then land there or maybe this goes in the beginning it's a pivot point and that that's kind of like a discovery process but i do come up with the nugget and then build build the house around that got it okay so there's a video will you listen will you tell us a little bit about it really quick so we can show it yes yes for sure so this um we were reached out to i might be i, I apologize if i'm getting the organizations mixed up but i believe if the dick clark foundation produces the golden globes pre-show um in in conjunction with the hf uh hfpa and so they reached out to get lit about uh producing a, a segment that kind of like you know encapsulates this moment in time where that we all are in um and so we put together a a uh a bit of a, a pitch or proposal for the folks and they said yeah this is great and so then we had our we had our poets step up and and, and film it go on location had the script and uh it turned into a piece that actually led into the golden globes uh telecast this this year in february if a tree falls in a forest but there's no one around to hear it does it make a sound if your team wins the championship and no one's there to see, does it really make a difference? If a teen writes a poem, but no one's there to read, can it make history? We are done playing the roles we were given. Now we're writing our own roles into existence. Out of necessity, we bloom as we must, wild until we are free. Everyone has at least one great poem within them. A great story, a moment, instant classic, waiting to become scene one, act wondrous. A mind craft into a voice, craft into a verse is the first brick in my freedom. So, we've become the voice of reason. All the reasons to hope gather in our chosen name. In a world that seems built on bending the truth through these screens, through these avatars, we tell our stories, learn to see the forest for ourselves, turn air, water, lights into this life, same as you. So, so the question, so the question is, is, when this tree, this when tree breaks, this tree and grows limb, and crawls by limb, by limb, limb to the by mic, limb to the mic, to the platform, to the mic, from to this room to the boardroom, from this room to a boardroom, and a more perfect, perfect view, view. When, you when you are sitting, are sitting right, right there. there. Will you listen? Hi, 
I'm Tim Gaspar with Gaspar Insurance, and we are thrilled to announce that we're the proud sponsor of the Valley Cultural Foundation's new Arts on the Move podcast. The Valley Cultural Foundation does fantastic work here in the San Fernando Valley, bringing arts and music and culture to all of us. Did you know U2's first concert in the United States was right here in Reseda at the Reseda Country Club? And Bruno Mars was actually discovered in Woodland Hills at Pickwick's Pub? Very, very cool. As the leading auto and home insurance agency in the San Fernando Valley, we're thrilled to be a part of all of this. And as part of this podcast, if you call our office and get a quote for auto, home, or earthquake insurance, you'll get a $10 Amazon gift card just for making the call. So please call one of our team members today and go to GasparInsurance.com and let us know that you heard about us on the podcast. Now, enjoy the podcast and have a great day. Real estate properties. My wife Katie and I want to take a moment to say thank you very much for all your support throughout the years. And you know what? We even have over the years have been supporting the Valley Cultural Foundation. The Valley Cultural Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit that brings the community together. Whether it be arts, music, there's nothing like the Valley Cultural Foundation. So give them a call, find out what it is they do, and be part of it. In the meantime, if you're thinking about buying and selling real estate, give Joe and Katie Andrews a call, and you can reach us at joeandkatieandrews.com. Proud to be part of the Pinnacle State family. So thank you very much. We'll talk to you soon. Open with over 200 retailers ready to serve you. Westfield Reward members can earn 2.5% cash back when you shop at any Westfield Topanga and the Village Store or Restaurant and up to 750 cash back when shopping luxury. So sign up today and get exclusive access to events, gift with purchases, and more. Visit westfield.com slash Topanga or text 818-306-5956 to learn more. Now for tonight's emerging artist, we have two students from the Get Lit Foundation, Words Ignite. These young women have thoughts to share with the help of Stevie and Mason. So let's go ahead and bring the girls. We have Salome Agboroji. If you are there, go ahead and join us. And then we have Courtenay. Hello, good evening, everyone. Yay, we got you ladies <laughs> on the show. Formerly welcome to Arts on the Move podcast. Want to go ahead and introduce yourselves first, Courtney? Please tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Courtney Minor. I'm 19 years old right now. I'm a UCLA theater major. I'm first year theater major, and yeah, I'm one of Get Lit's um, Get Lit Players, which is their youth poets. Um, and I'm here with my friend Salome. Um, <laughs> yeah, my, my name is Salome Agbaroji. I'm also a Get Lit player. I'm 15 and sophomore in high school, and I also write poetry along with Get Lit, and I love it. I love it. I can't wait to, to uh, hear about your, your piece. Okay, so when did you know that, um, either actually both girls an answer this, when did you guys both know that you had the passion to for the written word? Cortina, you want to go first? Um, for sure. I kind of ended up in poetry. I mentioned that I do theater and so it was kind of a pretty natural progression of I'm already I've already got the stage skills down and I would write a lot recreationally. I would do a lot of like fan fiction when I was in middle school and so it kind of worked out pretty well to merge those two aspects of my artistry and I ended up specifically with Get Lit. Just last year I did a contest that they have coming up again, I believe annually in May. Um, and from there, I was invited to audition, and then I did, and here I am. And I guess for me, um, a pretty similar story. I mean, um, I've always loved writing, whether it was like writing music, specifically raps, and I think that's what led me straight into poetry because we would have a poetry writing workshop at my library. I'm like, hey, that's similar to what I already do. And I'd be excited to go. The only program there that I was excited to go to or in my English class, if they had a poetry assignment, I'd be like, yay, I get to basically write a rap, but <laughs> not with music. And I think through that, I started to realize, hey, I'm consistently excited whenever poetry comes up in the conversation. So maybe I should pursue it. And I also did the Why I Rise competition like this time last year and that's also how I was like first introduced into Get Lit and then everything just started happening after that. That's awesome. So 
Courtney, uh, I want to ask you about your written word, the poem, Black Joy and Act Up. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, I And I mentioned it in the poem, but there was this sentiment kind of circulating around, especially, you know, last summer when we were having this heightened digital attention on the Black Lives Matter movement, where um, it said, like, Black Joy is resistance. And it was one of those things where I was like, yes and no and i was going back and forth and it took a while and i'm still sorting through like the like immediate responses i'm having to this statement um but it's kind of like i understand i, I get it because if we're pitting liberation as our ultimate goal you know of social change and social reformation and all of those then like i understand it's like here's this emotion that we've been so systemically deprived of and we're kind of like reclaiming it and that was an original title it's been through so many revisions but it was originally titled black joy as a reclaiming um and so in that sense i understand i understand it's like to be able to claim this and say this is my feeling and i'm taking it back it's like that makes a statement towards the whole social movement but then i'm also like for lack of a better phrase like why should we carry that burden and so i wrote this poem in an attempt to kind of help myself process through those thoughts and those feelings and try to start sorting them out and get a grasp on why they kept like propping up so tangentially in me. Um, and this is a poem where it is right now. Who's to say if it'll stay where it is right now? But um, yeah, I write poetry to help myself tolerate everything, I guess, in the world. That's one part of it. And this is an example. This poem was an example of that for sure. All right, let's go ahead and share the poem. So this is Black Joy as an act of. I have heard that black joy is resistance, that black joy is an act of resistance, which paints for me black joy as a compound noun, as a revelation that crams subtext into my existence, as a filter that translates my emotion into a movement. And maybe I'm putting nuances in the phrase's mouth, but overthinking has spared me more times than it hasn't. Blocked the number of people who called me pretty for a black girl, kept my hands visible when walking past store security, is this habit or survival tactic that I so often devil's advocate away some of the goodwill I receive? That my first post-revelation realization was, this joy doesn't belong to me. This joy doesn't belong to us. For our salvation or our damnation, there is conflict in our contentment, defiance in our delight. We have politics wedged in the teeth of our grins that we have spent decades trying to toothpick out but have only succeeded in cramming deeper. I wish I didn't have to hoard my joy. Wish I didn't have to stockpile smiles in anticipation of the next cultural recession, dreading the moment where I can no longer bring myself to be happy despite. I wish I didn't have to fight for my joy. Wish I didn't have to protect my joy because I've heard that one too. Protect black joy. The act that follows our joy is defense mode. We shove our laughter into fallout shelters and throw shields up in front of our smiles and lock guard our triumphs in cold protected safes. I'm just speculating, but could that be why so many black people run away when they laugh? Scurry in the face of humor like we're anticipating an assault, like our limbs are sensing a threat that our minds are desensitized against? The same way people see black before they see artist or poet or anything, the fact that we aren't even allowed regular joy, that even our joy must be defined by blackness. I don't want any more radical happiness. I want to have moments where I am happy for happiness's sake and not because I have revolutionized yet another inborn quality of my being. I want my joy to be an act of being. My smiles as the prologues to my laughter, as the punctuators of my triumphs. I want black joy as an act of healing, as an act of self-loving, as an act of heart persevering. I take black joy as a moment. I take black joy as in the joy of this black body. I take black joy, but as it is an act of this body. Wow, I felt that. You go girl, that was really good. Courtney, uh, what keeps you motivated? Um, definitely moments like this, um, cause you know, every, it's a common narrative where it's like the arts, you're not going to get anywhere with the arts, you're not going to get paid enough, whatever. But like the way my heart starts racing when I'm like working on a poem, that is like, that's the sweet spot. That is like a moment of existence that is nearly like irreplicable and it makes all of it worth it. Like, yeah, I'll eat beans for a week. Like it's worth it because it's just to share this part of myself with 
so many different people from so many walks of life across all these different platforms. I, I love it here. It's amazing. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, Salome, uh, what is uh, actually the process when you are creating? Well, this um, the specific poem I'm performing today was inspired um, by an art exhibit at the Los Angeles Museum, Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Um, there's a specific showing of, um, I think from a black artist showing like black people just art about black culture, black history, all different types of assortments. And when I saw that amazing art, I was incredibly inspired and I decided that this poem is about black people being happy. I didn't know what it was gonna be about, but I knew it wasn't gonna be black suffering. I knew it wasn't gonna be oppression. Yeah, Courtney, we were on the same <laughs> same wavelength there because as a poet, um, it's easy to default to the negative. And I think that's something every single poet can like um, align with. It's very easy to continue to write about what hurts us or what's wrong with the world. And that's very important too, because using the platform, we should be able to address those things. But with this poem in particular, I said, I'm going to make a poem that show that displays a world in which black people are just happy. And that's the end of the story. Literally, that's what the poem is about. <laughs> I love it. You're all about positivity. I love it. Uh, where, where do you feel the written word will take? Where I, I think like take you it, I, oh uh, I, I feel like the skill of being able to create a story or a narrative in a poem which is very different from a short story or a novel because it's a very short amount of time to say what you want to say I think that skill is useful in almost any field because whether you're a nuclear biologist needing to give a speech and you need to catch the attention of the uh, the huge auditorium that you're speaking to. Almost every action that we do has poetry in, in it. Just in the same way, I might take extra time for nails to dry or something. I, I feel like the skills that I've required from poetry, being able to see the world from a whole new perspective, I feel like that'll take me very far and hopefully help advance the people that hear it too. That's awesome. Okay, are you ready to recite your poem? I'm ready to hear it. <laughs> Yes, I am, thank you. So this poem is called In the Palm of Your Hands. In the palm of your hands is a heart, blessed with a body, black and abundant. This is the body, the overflow of anatomy of chiffon and kente blend. Church bells resonate homecoming in the throat, black body unearthed, riveting. In these pastures, the weather is porgy and bess. Stretch the arms, gather an ounce of summertime, kiss the loose petals that fall in your hand. Sweet honey riptide cascade, river encore, riptides with cornmeal flattery because cool cats keep it trill. I made a flower for you out of cotton just to chill with you, K-Dot. We know death is a double dutch to heaven, so we dance. The player tickles piano in the palms of his hands. The heels thankful that all the black keys were designed to harmonize. Amen to jazz and the gut where it's born, to soul train and coal train in the palms of his hands, to the way Ma and Pa met, and that may I have this dance back in 82. Black bodies meet with the eyes to say, I know you, to return, I know you too. This is the audacious exhale of black joy, not memories of tribal drums and the unknowing of colored shirts. It's the laugh so hard that it hurts, molars on display, not hand-me-down complacent, content with bare minimum, but today knowing that the black body can inhabit happiness. The black body can inhabit happiness. It is engaging the inheritance and calling it mind. Black joy, beauty unbeheld, joys unfulfilled, selflessly stored for later, generational wealth, equity, melancholy melodies, grandma's remedies and the wounds they mend, the time stop, just as fruit, partake in the bebop as discos create hairdos undone, strobe light, lipstick transfer make midriff glisten, accept the bliss, 
manifest and bless it with the heart in the palm of your hands. That was beautiful. I loved it. That was in the palms of your hand. My goodness, we are now open for discussion. We're going to go ahead and let everyone join. Uh, Stevie, hello, Mason. What did you hey. think, Stevie? I just heard some amazing female prolific poets. I don't know about you. I, I enjoyed both of them. Uh, they're very powerful. I love the way the rhythm's created. I love the enunciation. I like two different viewpoints, but yet parallel experiences. And I really... I just, it's very moving and very touching. I think you guys, I think I could learn more from you maybe than you can learn from me. I'm very grateful oh, to hear those poems. You heard that? Okay. <laughs> um, Courtney and Salome, is there any any questions you want to ask Stevie? Um, he's here for any advice or any tips of anything. I mean, I I just performed my poems and Courtney did also. And you have expressed that you write poetry and as such a successful, I, I could say lyricist, because poetry is almost music in itself. Like, what's your process of creating um, these lyrical works and this literature that you take so much pride in? Mm -mm. I would say for me, the process is all of a sudden, like you came up with your concept, something like that will grab me and it starts moving through my physical body. A poem is very physical too. I know you said, Courtenay, that you didn't like sports that much, but you put so much sport kind of energy. I, 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 that's the only, I would say you're doing it, but you may not acknowledge that you're doing that. But I like the physicality that you, you use your hands, you use your feelings and you get to a depth because the only thing is, until you change inwardly, the poems are beautiful and important, but the thing you both are asking for is some kind of change in the world and yourself and like that. Mm -hmm. So that means you also are responsible for your poem that you live, try to, we all fall short, live the way you write. Like I know in the Galactic Symphonies that did anyone you know teach the roses how to grow? Like, how can you, unless you believe in a divine or something or more than just what's within you, within your limited you, but the you that connects with everything. I feel that, I think both of you relate to that. I'm, I'm, I tell you, it's powerful. I love Amanda Gorman when I saw that, but you guys are just as good and, and just as powerful. I get a real strong feeling and I like, I really like it a lot. I, I, that's my initial reaction and I could go on, but that, you know, can ask me anything specifically, but I, I think also I like the way when you perform, you guys already, did you study that or is that inborn the way you, you know, I like the enunciation part too, you know, to make the words important and you know which ones you want to make important. That's a big part of what you do. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think it's something, I think it's almost both. Um, you kind of have to practice performance with poetry because in spoken word, that's the like half of it. There's the written part, but performing it is really what makes it go off. But I'd say, um, when you just when you write the poem and you have that point that's very passionate you can't help but like make sure the audience hears that part so and when i both, say yeah you both black, feel it. i like the way you both feel it mm -hmm. i i mean you have to to re recite like that and i think that's fantastic how about you Claire, today i well, before I got on here, I was just reading it over and over and over and over again out loud. I was like, you cannot stumble this time. That is not acceptable with these stakes right now. So definitely emphasizing what Salome pointed out about um, practicing through repetition. Um, and I think one of the cool things, maybe for me, is like the more I read it, the more I read it, is the more I find out what does work both auditory um, and on the paper, because I was changing this poem right before right before like last night during rehearsal i was changing the poem i was changing the poem because spoken word i think and then written poetry one of those nuances that like differentiate them is like is the liveliness of spoken word and it's happening right here right now um i could change a line as i'm performing you would never know no. that's for me to know that's for you to find out um so i think i'm the definitely... same because i sometimes don't remember the whole thing and i well, something else that hits me, and I, I, I relate to that, too. 
you. And that's one thing I think I'm grateful for. Um, like, no, it's my poem. What are you going to do if I change the line? Yeah. Yes, that's true. Mason, do you have any questions for Stevie? I mean, this was a great performance. You're just smiling, like big old Chuck E. Cheese smile. Like you're, I know you're very proud of these girls. Um, tell us. Tell us. And there's, just, there's just so many things that, that, are, that get said in the course of listening to three brilliant people have a conversation. And so I'm sitting here and like, check out, oh, I want to go back to that. Oh, that thing Steve said about that. Yeah, I'm going to come back. And so, uh, I mean... Okay. The, the the one that I love the most is is Steve saying that the po the po the physical part of the poetry and you can like actually feel it and that's something that um, when I'm in in teacher mode I try to like show and 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 convey to to my students of being like look there's a lot of people get a little too worried about am I doing it right am I am I writing this, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing with this poem? And they mean more like structurally, but like, I, I really think that like, yo, when you have that feeling and you're the, the pilot and passenger of your own pen in that moment and you feel like, yo, I'm the one doing this, but even I don't know what's happening next, like that's when you're doing it right. You're and doing a wonderful job because to come up with, two, I mean, I expect two, there's gonna be one else, but to have both so strong, I mean, I, I've been to Bob too many poetry readings, put it that way, that some I didn't want to go to and some I did, but I like it that it's not just the standard type of poetry for me. It's, it's got the emotional impact. And if you want to reach and touch an audience like they do, when you get and look someone, I look, you know, just like when you say, I love you, you can tell someone that's trying to impress you. And also, I think you both have learned the, the, a quality which maybe hasn't been defined or maybe you've heard it. The thing I like, you're both reciting to communicate as opposed, a lot of rappers and stuff that are really good, but they try to do it to impress you. You guys don't do that. That's, now I could be, my observation is you are letting out your gut and putting it there to either like it or not. You know, and I think you both do that. If I'm wrong, you can tell me. But I got that feeling of the urgency that you got. Well, you want to communicate, but you're like, but you know, the the one a lot of the rappers are good, but they'll do the braggadocio thing, and for a while it's okay. But then you say, "Come on now, you know, come on now, you know." I mean, you're not the God. You are not God. You know, you you're communicating. You're touching other lives. And the thing is, you could all, both be leaders in anything you want in your community because with this kind of consciousness it should develop into actions that you follow through on these convictions in your life i know that's a tall order does that make any sense mm -hmm, definitely and I, I i like how you like brought up rap because i love rap culture just because there is like within the culture there's so much showing off that i love i absolutely love it and then there's also like the culture of you know, using it to express joy and pain and power, which I think is also really cool. And that yeah. might just be inspiration for a new poem that's coming up right now. <laughs> but um, you both seem like that. You know, when I was before there was rap, I was actually doing sim similar to rap. Uh, but in the 60s, like on my poetry album, the spoken one, World of Peace, there's a poem in there. Um, what's in it? It's called um, Candy Face Lane. And I mean, I think you what you could rap it. It was like Candy Face Lane below the gate is filled with only fright and hate and has brought man to this terrible state. A candy kiss here, a candy kiss there. Words, no heart in them, nothing but air below the facade of the candy face lies the destruction of the race of all mankind. Looking so desperately, hoping to find it in the candy field, dream a glimpse of the real, a hush of the scream. Soul shattered, beginning to shout Candy Face, Candy Face, the sugar's run out. There's no peppermint left, no chocolate despair, only mankind full of despair. The nuclear age waits for a wonderful sage to turn history's page. So, I mean, like, so this is in the, it's on my album. And there was, I hadn't even heard a rap album at that point, but it, it's similar, you know, like with a, a good rapper could probably do that as a rap or something. Maybe they want to change stuff. But uh, I just think that that rhythm is very appealing and that style, and you've got your own style, but. I, I'm very in tune with that, very in tune. Thank and you, the, the whole organization, and you too, the host and the
the teacher, I mean, you, you guys are all great. I'm so grateful to Lori and Nora. I thought I would drive them nuts, but maybe no. I did. I'm not sure. <laughs> we heard you loud and clear, Stevie. Thank you so much. We want to thank you all for being a part of Arts on the Move podcast. And we can't wait for your future, uh, more written words. We can't wait for what the future holds for all of you. I know that we'll be hearing from you guys really soon. The Shumash people have stood proud along the California coast for thousands of years. Today, we stand for education. With our tribal youth high school graduation rate at 100%, we stand for giving. As contributors of more than $25 million to the community, we stand for the environment, diverting 90% of our waste stream from landfills. And we stand for wellness, serving 3,000 patients from our health clinic. We are the Santa Ynez Band of Shumash Indians, standing proud with the Valley Cultural Foundation. Amazon uses a lot of technology, but the real magic is the people. Jerry, I think it's time for a dance move. I have great friends that work here. We laugh, we joke, but we also get our job done. We support each other, and we just rock it out. <laughs> there are so many people coming together to create one goal. Everybody always wants to make sure you're safe and having fun. Work friends turn into work family. <laughs>